Mother's Day isn't a feast day on the church calendar, but it probably should be. I learned early in my ministry that it ranks right after Christmas and Easter ahead of Pentecost and Reformation Day. On Mother's Day, we handed out carnations, red carnations in honor of one's mother, white carnations in their memory. There are a few federal holidays that are also holy days. Thanksgiving is one, Memorial Day is another. On the last Monday in May, we honor the men and women who died while serving in the military. It was originally called Decoration Day because families would visit the cemetery to put flags and flowers on the graves. Mother's Day and Memorial Day have a lot in common. They're both about service and sacrifice. I know that because my mother, who grew up during the Depression and started a family during the war, reminded us how little she had and how much she gave and sacrificed for her children. She sounded a little like Jesus in today's gospel. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. It's not until you grow up and have children of your own that you realize how much those words mean. You or I might profess to lay down our life for another, like Jesus, our mothers actually did, whether by birth or by adoption. We usually call God our Father. It's a term of endearment that Jesus used so that we would know that God loves us. It's just as true to call God our mother, since both bring new life into the world. After Pam's sermon, the choir will sing a song with music written by Carolyn Jennings, who for many years was a member here at Lord of Life. The lyrics were written by Jean Jansen and based on an ancient text of Julian of Norwich. It begins like this, Mother in God, you gave me birth in the bright morning of the world. Creator, source of every breath, you are my rain, my wind, my sun. And it closes with imagery from last Sunday's gospel about the vine. Mothering spirit, nurturing one, in arms of patience, hold me close, so that in faith I root and grow until I flower, until I know. Most of us at Lord of Life hold white carnations now in memory of the moms who gave us birth and patiently held us close until we grew, until we knew the meaning of life. There is no greater love. There is no greater love than this to lay down one's life for another in service and in sacrifice. Happy Mother's Day. With thanks for those who brought us into the bright morning of the world and in memory of those who patiently held us close. Welcome to worship, welcome to Lord of Life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you joys beyond understanding. Pour into our hearts such love for you that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel, according to John, chapter 15, beginning at the ninth verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus is speaking. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you. 
and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, the fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We learn pretty early on in life what it means to be chosen and how special we feel when we are and how disappointed we are when we are not. From our earliest days of socialization, we learn that the competitive nature of our world separates us into groups, classes, teams, cliques, and other segmented definitions. Sometimes the reality of this sorting is painful when we realize that we've not been chosen for the best group, but perhaps the group that qualifies us as disfavored or not quite fitting into the norm. When we are chosen for what we think is the best group or when we work our way into that group, we're filled with a sensation of happiness and success and yet eventually that happiness will fade and there will be something better that we aspire to. Oftentimes, this happiness misses the mark when what we really need is to experience true joy. I'll come back to joy a little later. I remember one of those sorting out experiences that I had in the sixth grade. Clearly, it must have been profound because that's an awfully long time ago, and I still remember it well. My family and I had just moved from California to Phoenix, and I felt very much like a fish out of water in this new social structure. I was really shy, and the whole educational paradigm of school here was completely different to what I had been accustomed to in my former school. There was really only one time during the school day when I felt at ease and comfortable, and that was in choir class. I knew I could fit in there. Well, not long after the start of the school year, our choir teacher, Mrs. Ray, announced that she would be listening to each one of us and observing us for the purpose of choosing a performing choir for special assemblies and occasional interscholastic field trips. Oh, I desperately wanted to be chosen as part of that group. Well, finally, the day of the announcement came, and Mrs. Ray read the names of the students chosen, and I was not included. She made a remark that I could have been picked if I had only been more attentive in class. Well, I knew immediately that something else was at play here because I could not have been more attentive in class. I could not have sat in my chair any straighter. I could not have learned those songs any more thoroughly. And I could not have tried any harder. I had been overlooked, as if invisible, and I was crushed. Being invisible is a painful thing to be. I went home nearly in tears, and I talked to my parents, and they helped me to work out a plan. So I began bringing my guitar to school, and at every lunchtime, instead of being out on the playground, I was sitting right outside Mrs. Ray's classroom door, playing my guitar and singing. Well, after a week or two of this, in the middle of a song, her classroom door flew open, and Mrs. Ray wanted to know who I was and why I had not tried out for her performance choir. 
Well, I found myself biting my tongue about being overlooked. And she invited me into her room, asked me to sing for her, and I was not only included in the choir, but given a solo song for our first performance. I was happy then, but the sting of not being seen or chosen the first time made a permanent impression. And it planted a doubt about inadequacy that lingered long after the event. Mrs. Ray didn't even remember that I was part of her class. Well, my story is rather inconsequential in the big picture, but it's remained as an anecdote in my memory. It's an experience which might also be chalked up as a story of perseverance rather than disappointment, if you look at it from a different angle. And there are certainly more serious ways that being chosen or not impacts lives. And these impacts can be long-lasting, beyond one short-lived experience, turning into formational events which live on by affecting generations of people. That is when the separating out becomes damaging and not just friendly competition. That is particularly so when the voices of those experiencing those events of being chosen or not are silenced or ignored. We heard from Pastor Steve last week about some of the ways people are separated out, which causes real damage to their lives and their ability to live into their full potential. Separations by gender, color, sexual orientation, disability, and yes, age. All the ways that serve to keep people out or keep people under. Separations which denying access to what is needed to thrive, education, housing, good nourishment, fair employment, and even clean water and air. These are basics that we all need to thrive. The long-term damage is allowed to live on when we don't talk about, acknowledge, give voice to, and recognize how injury has occurred, and then take responsibility. Burying what is painful and embarrassing in avoidance doesn't allow real healing, and even more importantly, reparation for what is lost. Brian Stevenson is a lawyer, a social justice activist, an executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, and a law professor at New York University School of Law. He is also someone who has lived the experience, like so many others, of what it means to be separated out. He was born in 1959 in a small town in southern Delaware, and he experienced segregation in his elementary school. He went to a colored school. By second grade, the school had been desegregated, but the same rules still applied. Black children weren't allowed to play with white kids. Drinking fountains were marked for separate use. And out in the bigger community, black kids and their parents used back doors at doctor's offices and for dentist visits, while white people entered through the front door. And the list goes on and on. These conditions lived and observed as the accepted norms of the day but they were no less damaging for those who were subjected to the restrictions. These were clear demarcations of who was chosen and who was not. Stevenson has now authored many books about inequality and the damage it does and how it is couched in normalcy, leaving the impression that by some imaginary construct, certain bodies are better than others and more deserving. One such writing, which is now also a movie, is called Just Mercy, a story of justice and redemption. And it brings to light the legacy of the unchosen, which has served to promote inequality in the criminal legal system of our present day. Stevenson has dedicated his life to working for equality and justice, and one way he has done this is to give public acknowledgement of the atrocities inflicted upon those brought to this nation as slaves. 
He has purchased six acres of land in Montgomery, Alabama for the development of a national memorial for peace and justice to commemorate the nearly 4,000 people who were lynched in the South from 1877 to 1950. The memorial opened in 2018. Included in this memorial is an exhibit which is constructed inside a former slave warehouse in Montgomery where awareness is made public as to how the history of slavery is the underpinning for the present day epidemic of disproportionate mass incarceration of people of color. Sadly, this legacy is one which perpetu perpetuates the inability to thrive for so many in our world today. Living in God's love is how everyone is able to thrive. And that is what God would have us do. To thrive is not just an outcome of what we strive to achieve as social beings or economic contributors, but rather the potential that God has in mind for every living creature. And that is the joy that I spoke about earlier. The joy which is so much more than mere happiness. When others thrive, everyone is blessed. When we love one another, we are acknowledging that all should have the opportunity to thrive and to flourish, not certain chosen groups. Jesus came to us from God so that in Jesus' love, all would know what it is to be beloved and to be chosen. Unlike my experience with my sixth grade teacher, we don't need to go to extra lengths to attract Jesus' attention. Jesus knows us, and Jesus notices us already. Thank goodness we don't need to rely on anything we do where Jesus is concerned, because Jesus chose us first. Jesus came to us because God so loved us first in spite of anything that we can or might do. In the Acts lesson this week, we clearly hear that all are welcome into the family. The gifts of baptism are for everyone, not a select or chosen group, but all people. God's kingdom is not to be withheld or parceled out to some. It is freely given for every human being and for all creation. Love from God, love for God, and love for every child of God is how we abide in God's embrace. Abiding in God's embrace is what brings us true joy and not just fleeting happiness. Jesus came to us and for us out of love and he doesn't bring a Harry Potter sorting hat. We are all in the family. Jesus lives the example and gives us the greatest of all, the commandments, that we must love one another. Just as Jesus began his ministry to and with the first disciples, he does the same with us. He brings us along from servanthood into friendship and calls us family. We are in the family so that we may thrive and so that in his love, others can thrive as well. The family of God is a family of love, not like imperfect human families that can be damaging and even dysfunctional but the family of God, where love is at the very best and the very purest, is Jesus' love complete. Love that covers any blemish and imperfection that surfaces in our own human frailty. This is the kind of love that looks past cultural structures which divide, relegating some to the bottom while others rise to the top. This love, Jesus' love, sees what God sees in who we are as God's creation. God is not interested in designs which separate us, but rather in how we love. Jesus gives us the ultimate example of this self-emptying love by his work on the cross. I was sharing with Eye Opener Group this week, the Bible study on Thursday mornings, that the notion of laying down one's own life for someone else was never really something I could embrace until I had children. 
suddenly love had a new definition, which was not about me, but about protection, guidance, encouragement, dependability, responsibility, and sacrifice for two small people I didn't even know yet. I could completely imagine myself in between them and danger, even considering the prospect of my own demise if it came to that. There is something fierce about parental love. It's a whole different dynamic than romantic love or even sibling love. Parental love is deep and arrives with such force that it alters everything about the way you view the world. It's the sudden awareness which is all about the well-being of another and so much less about the well-being of self. Parental love is the same whether you're a birth parent or an adoptive parent. It is still a sacrificial love that moves any parent to extraordinary measures for the sake of that child. God knows something about this kind of extraordinary love. Jesus is that extraordinary love, and we are the children of the family. In the same way as the branches are nurtured by the vine, we cannot know Jesus and not know love. It is the love of Jesus that chooses us. It is the love of Jesus that carries us in times of despair and brings us to the joy which surpasses fleeting happiness. And when we extend that love to others for the sake of others, emptying ourselves, we get a glimpse of the depths of God's love for each one of us. Jesus doesn't suggest, imply, or offer options about love. He's very clear that to love one another is a command. If you love me, then you must love one another as I have loved you. Bringing injustices to light is love. Refusing to be silent where there is wrong is love. Defending those who are silenced is love. Challenging the status quo of normalcy when it damages others is love. Breaking the barriers of separation and chosenness is love and conducting our lives in a way which permits others to thrive is love. Joy is what we find when we show love. Living in the midst of God's parental love for us all is where we find our joy. Amen.
Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we turn to our time of prayer, I'll end each petition with, Hear us, O God, and I invite you to respond, Your mercy is great. Let us pray. Alive in the risen Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promised to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Loving God, you call us to be your fruit-bearing church. Strengthen the bonds among all Christian churches. Give us direction and inspiration to carry your good news to the ends of the earth. Today we pray for the Morovian Church, giving thanks for the life and witness of Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, renewer of the church and hymn writer. We thank you for his gifts of sharing the good news. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creating God, the earth praises you. The seas roar and the hills sing for joy. Fill the earth with your love, so that by their song, all creatures of land and sea and sky, burrowing and soaring, may call us to join with them in praise. We also pray for you to be with the firefighters who are battling raging fires throughout our country. Give them strength and safety. And for those in the Southeast, devastated by tornadoes and destructive rains, we pray that those who are reaching out for help will find the help provided. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Faithful Savior, you conquer the world, not with weapons, but with undying love. Plant your word in the hearts of the nation's leaders and give them your spirit so that the peoples of the world may live in peace. Where battles rage on for justice and truth, we pray your presence, your peace, your justice. In faraway places that are easy to forget, like Syria and Yemen, we pray for you to hear the cries of those seeking peace and shelter. Help those who can help step up and provide for the needs of the least. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Caring healer, you forget no one and accompany the lonely. Be present with those who are sick or suffering. In our church family, we lift up Ray and Brenda, Dorothea, Marilyn, Elaine, Terry, Ted, Doug, and Bob, and we pray for the family and friends of those who are mourning the death of Ruth and Frank and Dennis. We pray, dear God, that you continue to provide for those who need your healing touch. Give them healing and wholeness. Hold them in your loving arms. Be with all those who reach out to you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Gracious God, as a mother comforts her child, you comfort us. Bless mothers and mothering people in our lives. Comfort those who miss their mothers, mothers who grieve. We thank you, mothering God, for showing mothers how to best care and love for their children. Continue to show compassion on all mothers. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Gracious God, continue to shine your light on the ministry of our sister congregation, Christ Evangelical Lutheran Church in Goodyear. Be with their lay leaders and both pastors, Jeff Gallen and intern Dan Weikart. Continue to provide for their congregation your strength and love as they bring the good news of your son to their community. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, in whose name we say, Amen.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter, and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. Praise to you for, for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for your spirit poured out on all nations. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O God of resurrection and new life, Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us and then send us forth burning with justice, peace, and love. Come, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places, with earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars. We praise you, O God, blessed and holy Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you.
May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in God's grace. Amen. Please receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.